Last year I started making the weather videos and I got asked how climate change is going to affect paragliding. Well, it already is. I'm going to talk about some of the experiences I've had paragliding around the world and the meteorology behind it. How will climate change continue to affect paragliding? Years ago, I decided it was too risky to wait until retirement to go out and explore the world. The world is changing fast. Since working for a year observing weather in Antarctica in 2013, I've flown all over the world, especially in New Zealand's Southern Alps and Australia where I live, but also in Africa, the Asian Greater Ranges, the Andes, Rockies, and the Alps. I usually choose mountainous places I want to explore rather than known and well-established flying sites. So how do I assess the climate and the weather? I learnt my weather by reading everything I could, seeking to understand the basic physics behind it. Being a human sonde, flying as an active observer, and in 2016, by becoming a meteorologist. The first step in understanding weather is looking at climatology. What normally happens? What weather features are important in that part of the world? What are the global influences and how do they interact with the local environment? I've tried to get across the gist of meteorology in three videos. The first is about the energy budget of Earth, sunshine coming in, heat going back out. The second video is about what makes the wind blow, wind being one of the fundamental ways that heat is redistributed around the planet. The third video is about the role of latent heat, which stores energy during evaporation and releases it in storms. By changing the energy balance and trapping more heat, we gain 7% more water vapour for each degree Celsius of warming. This gives more energy to weather systems and it also makes hot, dry weather more frequent, persistent and intense. In Australia, we have mid-latitude weather in the south and tropical weather in the north. A strong cold front will bring very hot, dry air to Melbourne with a dramatic change in temperature as the front arrives. The cold air pushes around the Great Dividing Range, reaching Sydney as a southerly buster. But many fronts will stall on the New South Wales coast or weaken into a wind surge. In the tropics, the weather doesn't change much. Day-to-day -day temperatures are similar, as are atmospheric pressures, and we just have a wet season and a dry season. Climate change means more energy, particularly in the tropics where the warm air holds more water vapour. Latent heat from tropical storms is transported to the dry, subtropical, arid belts. These will extend over a greater range of Australia and most of the country will become drier and hotter. The climate trend is for wet regions to become wetter and dry regions drier. 2019 was the driest and hottest year ever in Australia. Around Brisbane this meant flying in winter was fantastic and I flew more country here than I had since learning to fly here 12 years ago. But by the end of the year it became too much. I complained to my mate that I didn't want to go flying over a smoky dust bowl. Every day at work we would see the smoke from the latest fires, a semi-permanent feature, drift across the Tasman. By the time the rains came, most of our remaining forest had been burnt to the ground in such a way that some estimated a billion animals had been killed. Because the landscape was so dry, a result of rainfall deficiencies, heat waves and record temperatures, the fires were so intense that most animals could not escape. I even flew over some rainforest that had been burned. The difference that topography makes was evident with steep areas burnt out completely and hollows and depressions being the safest spots. Traditionally, our driest years are in El Nino, when the wet weather is on the other side of the Pacific Ocean, but in 2019, this was neutral. A record positive Indian Ocean dipole, meaning a late monsoon retreat from India and late arrival in Australia, along with a negative southern annular mode, meaning a winter pattern with westerlies across southern Australia influenced 2019. 
Maybe our dominant climate influences will change in the future. Generally, these conditions, dry, hot, with dust and smoke, are exactly what we expect to see with climate change. Rainfall events will be less frequent and more severe. In the Northern Hemisphere, the Gulf Stream brings warm water to Europe. This raises the temperatures by about 10 degrees Celsius. The Gulf Stream is driven by the thermohaline circulation, the word coming from heat and salt, which cause density differences that drive ocean circulation. Changes in salinity as ice melts on Greenland may interfere with this ocean conveyor belt, slowing it down and regionally cooling Europe. In the 2019 X-Alps, we had a heat wave during the latter part of the race. In the race lead up, everyone was concerned about the viability of the route with unusual or unprecedented snow in the mountains. In Australia, we need average conditions for good snow. Cold is too dry, warm is rain. Increased precipitation is more likely to fall as snow in the European Alps, given the increased altitude and latitude. But we're also seeing cold records broken and snow falling in places where it has not been seen before or at those times of year. In Australia, we're breaking cold records too, but hot records are being broken at 12 times the rate. There's another mechanism increasing variability of weather in Europe. The significant reduction of the sea ice within the Arctic Circle is reducing the temperature contrast to the North Pole. This is weakening the jet stream. Like a slow moving river, it meanders more and moves slower, which means that we can see prolonged outbursts of cold or of heat. In the southern latitudes, the Antarctic ice sheet, average over, averaging over two kilometers thick, will last a lot longer than the Arctic sea ice. This would be favorable for the strong belt of westerlies buffeting New Zealand and Patagonia to continue. Competing against these westerlies is the expanding reach of the subtropical arid belt. During my last trip to New Zealand, we had over a week of flyable weather. A high pressure system dominated the region with light winds. The warm air mass meant later starts, often it wouldn't start working until about 1pm. And aside from all the pink snow, from Australian dust and ash, there was some more direct evidence of the fires across the Tasman. I usually suggest that two weeks is the minimum period to be assured of having at least one good day of weather in New Zealand. It can blow gale northwesterlies for that long, or sometimes you can have a blocking high. With the increased dominance of strong, slow moving, stubborn high pressure systems, we can expect more same weather in the future. We can also expect to see more flooding as we did on several occasions throughout the season where northwesterlies bring tropical moisture ahead of a cold front. In spring, my brother had to take a helicopter to work. There were multiple highways washed away. And when I left in February, there were helicopter evacuations of tracks and huts in the southwest and Guns Camp where it put in on the last pack rafting trip was severely affected. Generally, any increase in snowfall is offset by temperature increases with a clear trend in loss of glaciers, destabilizing mountains and cutting off access for mountaineers. In the Asian ranges, the mountains are closer to the equator. During the Indian pre-monsoon in 2014, Brian and I threaded our way between the snow line and low cloud bases and the high bush line. It was sometimes difficult to find a launch in China, I was just having a hard time with the altitude you needed to reach above the trees. In Thailand, I drove a scooter for a whole day just to find a patch to launch from where I could have a quick look around. In Pakistan, we were shown that farmers are claiming new land as climatic conditions change. The Pakistani next to me on the plane said that a lot of the tensions with India are associated with water management of a river that crosses their borders. Glacial melt is their lifeblood. In fact, I ended up in a bivy spot specifically chosen due to its proximity to a small glacier nearby. 
In Pakistan, the mountains north of Islamabad take the lion's share of the monsoonal moisture. The mountains north of that are very dry, but further north, the 7,000 metre peaks around Honza squeeze out every last drop of moisture. Friends of mine had to escape the Pakistani floods in 2010 as the fires raged across Russia. Warming oceans help to exacerbate these regional influences, in this case the Asian monsoon. I did a vol biv in Kyrgyzstan in September 2014. I was told that I'd arrived just after the temperature had cooled by about 10 degrees Celsius. In the peak of summer, it's very hot in the valleys and the ground has dried out following the thunderstorms and unstable weather of spring. I experienced that in May in Georgia. I was amazed that in Georgia, thunderstorms seemed to rumble through the area multiple times within a 24 hour period. It's typical in the mid latitudes for spring to be a volatile season because the high temperature contrast with the poles drives vigorous weather. Our crops and farm animals sourced from the Middle East are designed around spring rainfall. Later in summer, we make hay while the sun shines. This is discussed in Jared Diamond's book, Guns, Germs and Steel. Many of our productive agricultural areas in the mid latitudes are drying out as fronts move towards the poles. Tropical diseases, another key factor in preventing European colonization in the middle part of Africa, will also expand their range. Yes, there has always been climate change, but on a geological timescale, the Holocene, since the last ice age, has been a special stable climate period where civilization has flourished. Now, the pace of change is more rapid again. I once did a job interview and familiarization in Jordan, close to the birthplace of ancient civilizations. They are looking at cloud seeding to secure their water supply. Aside from soil loss, climate changes have meant our valuable agricultural land has moved away from the equator to Greece, then Europe, which used to be in the miserable outskirts. In Saudi Arabia, they are pumping fossil water deposited a thousand years ago. Water security will be a major issue, which may make some mountain areas, such as Tibet, politically unstable. Personally, I found the relaxed borders in the Alps one of the crucial ingredients for freedom in the hills. Unfortunately, I can't say the same about India, China or Pakistan. And in Georgia, close to the Russian border, I even had the border patrol chasing me around, unknown to me at the time, although everything worked out fine. I visited North America in 2018. The first part of my trip in Canada was incredible, with some of the best flying in my life. Glaciated mountains stretching into the, into the distance in all directions. But given the high latitude, it is a fairly short flying season. Precipitation falls as snow in the winter, and summers are dry. Just as I finished my Canada trip, fires started to become a problem. By the time I'd reached the US, the trip was just about a write-off, with intense wildfires, and smoke shutting down the season. Like Southeast Australia, it's subject to a warming, drying trend. I was told there are 60 something regulations to do with water rights, just in California. They're also seeing decimation of their forests due to mountain pine beetle. These are native, but have never been seen present in such large numbers. Biology that has adapted to certain conditions will have to adapt again or move on or be replaced by something else. Usually when there is a disruption to an ecosystem, there is an interim of pests and weeds before natural predators or competitors establish themselves in an ecological niche. I visited South America after the 2015 x -Helps. In Peru, generally easterly trade winds in the tropics are difficult to forecast for. Some of the local factors make it a place for strong thermals. High altitude, thin air, means less mass needs to be heated by the sun. The arid environment means more energy for heating rather than evaporation. The dry soils with air pockets means that only a thin layer of dirt needs to be heated. The lack of vegetation, aside from transpiration, i.e. evaporation, means heating is often of a shallower layer with higher contrasts and heat 
that is triggered more readily. It also means the landmass dries out much quicker after a rainfall event with less surface area to dry, something which enhances drying after deforestation. Tropical sun shines from more directly overhead and given clean air above the polluted coastal inversion, insulation or incoming solar radiation is intense. Stable air, it can be rough. Rather than cold air above encouraging free flow of air, thermals in a stable environment must force their way. The last day of my trip out of Cuzco and the subsequent trip underneath the inversion beneath the Altiplano were examples of this really rough air. Light and variable winds make the subtropics perfect for paragliding, but after reaching northern Argentina, I decided to take a long bus ride to get away from the desert. 16 hours later, I reached the windy westerlies near Mendoza. Skipping continents, another place where local influences are intense was Morocco. There was floods on my arrival with ankle deep water under the train station. I wondered if this was common, but I'd timed my trip for the arrival of the high pressure system. It was too stable on the coast, but once I reached the high atlas, conditions were strong. I felt that a site was blown out for an hour just because of a thermal. And during a cross country flight, I would be pushed around from time to time by a new wind. With simple large features in a desert landscape, local effects can be intense. Finally back to New Zealand where I usually like to get close to the main divide. It's far more popular to fly the tussock hills between Queenstown and Wanaka, but are they safer? The terrain is less intimidating, but with the dry unvegetated country, the thermals and the valley winds are often more intense. There's a section of country behind the mountains north of Araki Mount Cook that I would happily have a veil of cirrus during my transit. The thermals here can be so intense that it's counterproductive. As, like in my high flight in Desert Peru, each sinky glide reclaims all your height. In summary, I've put together a messy hodgepodge of different ideas, but what conclusions might we draw? Here are some suggestions. We can expect a drying, warming trend in most mid-latitude regions, increased extreme weather, heat waves, fires, dust storms, flooding, regional changes such as to the Gulf Stream, El Nino, Arctic warming are possible, local effects from vegetation and land use changes, ecosystem disruption and glacial retreat, geopolitical impacts on where we can travel to, and longer periods of similar weather. More of everything. So what can we do about it? Well, for me, it's really satisfying to organise a trip. Even though I do a lot of travelling, I do it on a bare bones approach. I don't buy things wastefully. I'm opportunistically shopping. I'm getting things second hand and I'm minimising my impact and the resources that I need. Apart from that, I guess it's good to make sure that your politicians and your investments are aware of environmental things and looking in the right direction. And yeah, just get out there and enjoy it while you can. <laughs>